At dawn on Wednesday, federal authorities raiding this Minneapolis home belonging to the man prosecutors say is the ringleader of one of the largest pandemic fraud schemes in the nation as they investigate the stunning effort to bribe a juror serving on his trial. The fate of that ringleader, Abiyazis Farah, and his six co-defendants tonight in the hands of the jury, which now includes two alternates. According to a warrant filed by the FBI, an unidentified woman showed up at the doorstep of juror number 52 on Sunday night with a gift bag containing $120,000 in cash and handed it to the juror's relative. The woman told the relative to tell juror number 52 to say not guilty tomorrow and there would be more of that present. That juror and a second who was asked about the alleged bribe by a family member, both dismissed by the judge, who ordered the defendants to turn over their phones and ordered them to be held in jail until there is a verdict. If it turns out that other jurors also had knowledge of this amount of money that was left, then it is possible that the entire integrity of the trial could have been undermined by this outside influence, which then could possibly lead to the judge declaring a mistrial. Authorities have not confirmed if the raid on Farah's home was connected to the bribe investigation. According to the criminal complaint, the defendants are accused of stealing more than $40 million of federal child nutrition program funds, money meant to feed children during the pandemic. But prosecutors allege the defendants generated fake invoices and used that money to buy multiple homes, properties, and luxury vehicles. As the jury deliberates, the source of that bribe is still a mystery, with no charges filed yet. It's possible that the defendants were involved, but that's no way the surefire sign. As members of the public come through, and many associates also, it's possible that other people could have identified who these jurors are. All right, Rahima Ellis joins us now on set. So, Rahima, do we have any sense of how massive this fraud case is and how far it goes? We don't know that yet. In fact, the truth is that the source of the alleged bribe is still a mystery. When the FBI raided this home connected to the alleged bribery scheme, they've not yet told us what the outcome is. And we may never know really what the FBI is going to uh, reveal about the uh, raid on that particular house. We know that there are seven current defendants. They are just the, the seven of the first of 70 defendants defendants that are going on trial in this alleged scheme and 18 others have already pleaded guilty to this um to what's going on here in terms of them looking at this fraud in terms of this money that was misused according to the prosecutors that was supposed to be used to feed to feed um, children during the covid and allegedly they used it for their own purposes Tonight, gruesome new details in the Gilgo Beach murders. Serial killer suspect Rex Hureman facing two new murder charges, now accused of killing a total of six women. Investigators discovering a disturbing document in his home, which they say was his blueprint plan to kill. Could he be linked to additional murders? In just moments, we speak with the district attorney leading that case. It was hair recovered from the victim's bodies that prosecutors used to tie Herman to the murders of 20-year-old Jessica Taylor and 28-year-old Sandra Costilla. Sandra's remains were found more than 30 years ago, back in 1993. That signaling to investigators that Herman was killing victims much longer than previously thought. The New York architect was first charged with the murders of four women you see here, dubbed the Gilgo Four. Their bodies discovered along a stretch of beach on Long Island. The women, all sex workers, killed over a span of several decades. The news of Hureman's arrest last July shocked the community. Neighbors stunned with how the 60-year-old father of two could be tied to such gruesome crimes. It's not just the new charges coming to light, but the new documents investigators say they discovered in Hureman's home in what they call a blueprint to the murders. Documents going into extreme detail with tasks to complete before, during, and after the killings. They include what problems he might come across, like DNA, tire marks, and blood stains. He also allegedly had a list of things to remember, including that sound travels to get sleep before the hunt and to, you know, hit harder, among other horrifying instructions. And this all goes back to 2011 when the first remains were found with a quarter mile, within a quarter mile of each other in Gilgo Beach, 
families of the victims waiting years for answers about their loved ones. Today, Jessica Taylor's cousin holding back tears. This year has been 21 years since she was taken from us, longer than the chance that she got to be alive. I can't express what this day means after waiting and hoping for answers. Hearman, of course, maintains his innocence as prosecutors continue to build their case against him. And because of all this, the top prosecutor in Suffolk County, District Attorney Ray Tierney, joins us now in studio live here on Top Story tonight. Mr. District Attorney, we appreciate you being here uh, on such a big day for your office. First of all, talk to us about the revelation that he may have been killing women longer than you originally thought. Yeah, as we uh, discussed today, uh, that's not a surprise to us. I think it's been publicly disclosed, but, uh, you know... Now you have proof, right? Yes, and as as the evidence uh, and as the investigation unfolded, uh, it became apparent to us that uh, his activities went as far back as 1993. We want to focus now on on what you guys are calling the planning document, right? Because this is what's been so troubling, so sickening to so many people out there. Um, Human's own, quote, homework, as you called it, on serial murder. I want to put up uh, on the screen for our viewers something so they can see part of this note. We We don't want to put too much of it because it's graphic. This is something he allegedly wrote. Things to remember. Sound travels, right? Get sleep before the hunt. Too tired creates problems. Hit harder. Too many hits to take down. Consider a hit to the face or neck next time for a takedown. Talk to me about the moment when your investigators found this document. So uh, we had... uh, um, seized a lot of evidence. We were going through it. Much of it was... uh encrypted. Uh, So we were going through it. There's a lot of uh, false leads, a lot of dead ends. And, uh, you know, when we found this document, we knew uh, right away that it was a significant document. Um, We have more from the document we want to show, right? Because some some of this stuff is just, you can't believe he spelled this out, right? I mean, again, you you guys describe it as a blueprint. Um, This is post-event. So these, theoretically, after the murders, destroy files, change tires, burn gloves, dispose of picks, have stories set. I, I mean, it's almost a cliff notes for murder, right? When you guys found this and, and, and you discovered this, and, and there's a lot of misspellings, we should say. Why do you think there, there are things misspelled there? That kind of stood out to me. It was so strange. I think um, probably because uh, the defendant is not as intelligent as he perceives himself to An be. An architect in Manhattan? Yes. Tell us, tell us more. This is new to us. Uh, no, I think he's, you know, I think he has, uh, I, I think that, you know, he uh, perceives himself a certain way. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, his obsession, um, uh, first and foremost, is uh, the, this uh, preoccupation with um, uh, luring and, and hunting women and, uh, and murdering them. Did, were you guys or have you guys yet been able to match things in that document to things he actually did to the victims? Uh, well, uh, certainly, and again, these are allegations, we need to prove them, but with regard to Jessica Taylor, uh, she was decapitated and her hands were removed, and in the planning document specifically uh, talks about that to hinder identification. Can you talk to us more about sort of the discovery of the document? I know you guys went back, uh, I don't know if it was a second or a third time, but recently you were back in the house. That's when this was uncovered? No, we, we recovered it in our initial search warrant in back in July of, of uh, last year. And, um, you know, we had about well over 400 uh, uh, documents and uh, devices that we had to go through. A lot of it was encrypted. So uh, we were painstakingly going through the so- software. And when you talk about something that was uh, made in 2000, you got to get the software back from 2000. So you have to put this all together. It takes a long time. Uh, we were finally able to uh, unencrypt this and, and uh, bring it back. Because he thought he had deleted things in some of these devices that you guys were able to recover. Sure. This particular document was found in unallocated space, which means it had been deleted uh, and it believed to have been, uh, you know, gone forever. But forensic experts can uh, retrieve that. I'm going to put up a book for our viewers so they can see this. It's another thing that was referenced inside the document, right? Uh, page numbers from the book about the FBI's mine hunter. okay? Um, it's a used copy of the book you guys apparently found as well. What do you think he gained from studying the, the police methods and the FBI's methods of sort of tracking serial killers? Well, we allege... Uh 
you know, in the planning document, there's specific uh, page numbers and passages of, of the Mind Hunter, which was written by an FBI a serial uh, killer hunter. And, uh, you know, we, we maintain and allege that this defendant uh, was looking at that, uh, that book not to gain insight, but to help him uh, to better uh, hone his craft as uh, a, a hunter of, of women. Is it fair to say a book like that that's out there in the public could help him? Uh, he certainly used it as such uh, because what he was trying to do was he wasn't trying to use it uh, to gain insight into, you know, his uh, motivations. He was trying to use it to gain insight into the methods by which law enforcement uh, uh, investigates and prosecutes. There, there was so, inf so much information on that blueprint that you guys found. Were, were you surprised that he would be as careless as that when he's done all these other things, number one and number two, have you ever seen something like this from a serial killer where they, they lay out the plan and how they do things? Is this a manifesto, if you will? Is this, is this something that's common? Well, I mean, you know, I think he thought that he had destroyed it. He didn't. Um, but I think it speaks to uh, the obsessiveness and the um, uh, this is occupying all his time. So he's constantly sort of meticulously going through things, planning things, replanning things. Uh, so uh, that's why a document like this was created. Do you think he had to take notes like this as a reminder because there were gaps in time where he stopped killing and or hunting? Well, you can see that, uh, that in, in the document it says next time, uh, and then it, it talks about other, other times when things didn't work out. So it's a reminder, uh, this worked, uh, so let's do it. This didn't work, so let's, let's not do it. How many more victims do you think might be out there? Well, uh, you know, we, we've, we've charged him with six murders. There's four more bodies uh, on Gilgo. Um, we said we were going to expand the investigation. Uh, Sandra Castillo was not on uh, Gilgo. So, uh, you know, we are going to continue to investigate. And once we, we do, uh, we'll allow our indictments to speak for us. There were times where one victim, and I, I, I feel, you know, I feel bad even talking about this because it's so sensitive, but there were times where victims were, their, their remains were spread out in different parts too. Well, what do you think the motive in that was? I think it was to hinder um, identification. So uh, in other words, the body is found in one place, but the, the head and the uh, hands are found in another place. And whatever identification uh, marks like tattoos, those are obliterated. Again, this is an attempt to obscure or, and in inhibit the ability. And he was person. dumping all along Long Island from what it looks like, right? Because he was going as far east as Southampton now. So we have we have bodies on Gilgo Beach. We have bodies um, on uh, in Southampton as well as at the end of the expressway, uh, Manorville. Is he cooperating in any any manner? Well, he's pled not guilty. These are allegations, uh, and we look forward to proving him. But, uh, you know, the case has taken a litigation posture. And then finally, you guys were back at the house, as, as I mentioned. Do you think you'll keep going back? Or do you think you guys are, are done with the house for right now? We'll, we'll go where the investigation takes us. And we we discovered uh, this document in March. And uh, this, along with other uh, results of the investigation, caused us to go back into that house. Ray, for people who may not follow this case as closely as we do here on Top Story, remind the viewers, why did your office, why did your police departments, your investigators, why were they able to crack open this case when it had been cold for so long? Well, I think we, we came together as, as a, a task force. There were a number of agencies working together, FBI, Suffolk County Police, my, um, my office to name a few. And what we were able to do was, um, you know, use DNA evidence, phone evidence, evidence uh, and basically uh, through a, a lot of, of information we were sort of piece uh, it together using all of these various different pieces of evidence. Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney we thank you for joining us here on Top Story. Thank you.